On the 7th of May 1881, the first ever Women's International took place at Edinburgh's Easter Road Stadium. Organised by suffragette Helen Matthews, two teams representing Scotland and England played out a 3-0 win for the home side in front of a crowd of just over 1,000 people. Now, this was long before women's football clubs, and it was the first organised fixture of its kind for any of these players. The event gained the attention of popular Scottish newspaper the Glasgow Herald, who printed a match report in which it praised some individual members of the team for their play. But the newspaper's coverage was not without its problems. For example, it gave a detailed description of the clothing of the female players before even providing the reader with the final score. Commentary on what female players wore, usually with much disdain, would become a fixation for the media and socially conservative opponents throughout the sport's history. Aware that what they were doing would not go down well with the wider public, Helen Matthews and other players created pseudonyms for the team sheets printed in the paper to protect their identities. Precautions like this would prove well justified. Just one week later, the teams played again in Glasgow. Word had spread quickly and this time around 5,000 spectators came to watch. A largely male crowd taunted both sides in the first half before turning violent in the second. Hundreds invaded the pitch, pushing the players who fled to the minibus they'd arrived in. The Nottinghamshire Guardian reported that members of the crowd tore up the stakes of the surrounding fence and threw them at the departing vehicle. A repeat of this match had been arranged in Kilmarnock for the next day, but was cancelled in the wake of the riots. In the days that followed, the mainstream press attacked what they described as the unsuitability of female players for football, but Matthews and her team acted quickly in defiance of their opposition. Within five days, they had organised another match, this time moving south to Blackburn and playing in front of a crowd of 4,000. The team then travelled to Manchester and Liverpool, set to play four more scheduled fixtures in June, but a forced cancellation, the experience of a second riotous pitch invasion within a month, and further attacks even in the liberal press at the time saw their playing attempts abruptly end. Women's football then took 14 years to recover. But when it did, it was once again led by its earliest pioneer. In 1895, Helen Matthews joined forces with Nettie J. Honeyball, a fellow suffragette who in late 1894 had founded the British Ladies Football Club in Crouch End in North London. Together, the two set about building the UK's first ever women's football club completely from scratch, mostly attracting middle-class women whose families were rich enough to support them while they trained. Rejecting the heavy criticism from newspapers around the country, Honeyball stood by her principles. On the 6th of February 1895, she told reporters, I founded the association late last year, with the fixed resolve of proving to the world that women are not the ornamental and useless creatures men have pictured. I must confess, my convictions on all matters where the sexes are so widely divided are all on the side of emancipation. And it was from the radical circles of the time that Honeyball, both club captain and secretary, looked to secure support. For the club's president, she recruited Lady Florence Dixie, Despite a history of supporting the British establishment in the First Anglo-Boer War of 1880 to 1881, in the 1890s, Florence Dixie had established herself as a leader of the radical movement to end the requirement that women wear dresses when playing sport, calling it ridiculous. During this time, she developed many new and more efficient clothing ideas for pursuits like cycling, and also spoke out publicly for girls to receive equal rights to education. She fully committed her support to Helen Matthews and Nettie Honeywell's project, and in February 1895 wrote in campaigning London newspaper, Pall Mall Gazette, There is no reason why football should not be played by women, and played well, too. Looking ahead, I see arising on the golden hilltops of progress above the mists of prejudice, football will be considered as natural a game for girls as boys. And ahead of the first ever British Ladies Football Club match in Crouch End on the 23rd of March the same year, Honeyball set about sewing all the strips herself, spurred on both by necessity and inspired by the clothing designs of Lady Florence Dixie. The match was a success, as 11,000 people witnessed a 7-1 victory for North over South London. Reports of the game in the press show the progress made since Matthew's first attempt 14 years before. While the reaction of many newspapers and indeed players' families was highly critical, this was not universally the case. Unlike before, some of the radical press rallied around the club, which even received support from mainstream sports newspaper The Sporting Man. The British Ladies Football Club was breaking boundaries in other ways too. Their opening match featured the first ever black women's footballer, Emma Clark. Clark was born in 1876 in Liverpool and was one of the few players from a working class background in the team. Her sister, Jane Clark, would also go on to join in the months that followed. From March to September of 1895, the team went on to play 34 games across England, Scotland and Ireland. This was the heyday of the first era of women's football, 
which regularly attracted crowds of thousands and, not without difficulty, played through a first season with an even more demanding fixture list than the men's game at the time. But sadly, it did not last. For reasons which are now lost to history, Honeyball and Matthews parted ways in late 1895. The two founders continued to organise teams independently, but both sides claimed to be the original British Ladies Football Club, to be fielding some of the same famous players and to have backing from Lady Florence Dixie. In the wake of the split, Lady Florence Dixie pulled her significant financial support from the project and would not back either team. On a shoestring budget, further matches were organised by both sides in 1896, but with dwindling funds and players, and in the face of even more bad press and a further riot at one of the games, the teams ultimately petered out. 